it's a little bit of a thinking man show. Not to say that you, you wouldn't like it. That's not a, at all what I'm saying. I, I definitely think you would. But um, if you're yeah, into just stu- keep backtracking there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like pulled my hammy from backpedaling. <laughs> Welcome to episode 144 of the Nerd You're Looking For podcast, a weekly nerd culture podcast that discusses the culture through various segments. My name, of course, is Patrick Kuhn, alongside my co-host, as always, that Tyler Hunt. How's it going, man? It's going well, man. How are you? I'm good. I'm kind of exhausted. If you guys follow us on Instagram or Facebook and all that good stuff, you know that I just got back from Vegas not too long ago. Uh, I have some family that live out there, and we were visiting them for my 30th birthday, so... uh I'm a little bit tired, a little jet lagged, but uh, it was a fun trip. I enjoyed it. It's going to be kind of a weird episode because we're not actually recording like we normally record. We're actually recording over Skype. Hopefully that doesn't come off in the episode like as far as the audio and stuff is concerned. But uh, I'm a little exhausted, but I'm going to kind of like power through it. Oh, man, you are you are a true hero. I know, right? (laughs) To just get through talking to your friend. Uh, (laughs) If only more people could be like you. I am coming to you live from Dayton, Ohio, which from what I can tell is basically the Evansville of Ohio. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Yeah, there's not much going on here. So I'm happy to record a podcast tonight. So looking forward to it. We're recording a little later than we usually do, but it should be fun. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, if this is your first episode, we kind of just uh, start off each episode by kind of just checking in with each other. We call it what we're into. So what are you into this week? I've had a super busy week. I am just behind the curtain. I'm training for a new job with the same company. So I've been really busy with that. But I have had time to um, watch a few different things. And one thing I want to talk about, it, it's kind of treading on your turf a little bit pat it okay um, sarah silverman's new uh stand-up special on i Netflix. have not watched it yet yeah it's called a speck of dust and this is the first of her stand-up that i've actually ever watched or listened to um i used to watch her show on and off I had that on comedy central but i was never really a religious viewer of it i just catch it from time to time I'd say I'm definitely more a fan of her in the movies that she's been a part of. So she was like in Pop Star. She's, of course, a voice in Wreck It Ralph. We watched Take That or Take This Waltz together, you and I did. And I don't think either of us liked that movie very much, but she was serviceable in it. And then uh, she's also sporadically on Bob's Burgers. Um, and she's really great on that show. Uh, so that being said, I've always found her charming and sarcastic. And those are some of my favorite qualities in a comedian. So I was really excited to watch this new Netflix special. Before I dive into how I felt about this special, I do want to say that I really like how Netflix is consistently putting out specials from great comedians. And I really hope this trend continues. I mean, I just this year, we've had specials from, oh, who all? Louis C.K., Dave Chappelle, um, Bill Burr, and I'm sure others I'm missing. Did Mike Merbiglia have one? Uh, Yes, he did. Uh, Thank God for the jokes. Yep, that's right. So they're doing... The Lord's work over there for sure. Just constantly putting stuff out. It seems like every Friday at this point. As for this special, uh, A Speck of Dust, it was definitely hit and miss. Um, There were parts that really made me laugh. And then there were also long stretches of time where I didn't even smile. So that was a bit disappointing for me. Um, She does get pretty political in the stand-up in a certain spot. And while I completely agree with her political stances and her and I are pretty much on the same page with things, I would have loved to hear more of her personal stories instead because you can get political comedy almost anywhere and there are other places that do it better. So I wish she wouldn't have devoted so much time to that in her stand-up. Um, one thing that she seems to specialize in, uh, at least in this special, like I said, this is only one of hers I've seen, is uh, relief laughter. So she would just get 
into like some serious or taboo topic and she would keep going deeper and deeper into it until it makes you kind of squirm because it's so awkward. And then whenever she hits that eventual punchline and the relief laughter comes, it's it's hilarious and it's like a, a load off almost. So I love awkward comedy like that. And she's really great at those types of jokes. Uh, one other thing I will say is that this special um, seemed to be edited in a lot of different parts, which was weird. I, you don't really see that much in many comedy specials, or at least what I've seen. And I think that's kind of worrisome. It makes me wonder really how authentic some of the laughs were. And uh, I'm wondering if they maybe took some bits out that didn't work with the audience because it was definitely just overcut um, in there some at some points. So all in all, it was an OK special. Like if you don't have anything better to watch, I'd suggest watching it. But it is far from the best I've seen this year. So uh, a little disappointed overall. Yeah, she's somebody that I, I feel is kind of like an acquired taste. Like I enjoy some of her stuff. She does tend to get a little bit awkward, like that type of comedy, which is which is kind of my bread and butter. I do enjoy that. But uh, some of the stuff that she talks about is, I mean, it's just not my cup of tea. So I, I generally don't uh, gravitate towards her stuff. I actually uh, didn't even know she had put one out just recently. So uh, that's news to me. But yeah, she... Uh, She's an acquired taste for sure. Um, she does tend to get a little political here and there, and that usually is not, uh, like I said, my cup of tea. But uh, yeah, I might have to check this one out. Yeah, I know what a fan you are of abortion jokes. Yes, I am. Is, there is a nice segment of it that is uh, basically an abortion joke, and it is really is probably one of my uh, favorite parts of the special. So you would definitely love that dark humor for sure. All right, cool, man. All right, dude. What have you been up to? What do you watch? So I have uh, also been pretty busy as well, but I did uh, last week binge the most recent season, season five of House of Cards. And I've talked about this show a couple of times, I think, on a couple of different episodes for what I'm into. I was kind of late to the party uh, with this show. I didn't start watching it until I think season three had come out. I really loved season one and uh, season two, especially the first season. Uh, Corey Stahl, who is an actor that I really like, his arc on season one and his performance is just the absolute best. Unfortunately, since then, uh, season three and four were just okay. I mean, if you're judging from the high bar that season one and season two uh, set, they're just – season three and, and season four are probably – Pretty disappointing if you're judging from that. But I mean, they're, they're decent seasons. Don't get me wrong. But, um, I just feel like they kind of got away from what made the series great. The first two seasons, Frank, who is of course played by Kevin Spacey, Frank Underwood, um, Claire, his wife to a lesser extent played by, um, damn it. What am I? What is, what Rob, is her? Robin Wright? Yes. I don't know. I didn't, I purposely didn't write it down because I was like, ah, I won't forget her name. And then of course <laughs> I forgot her name. Um, they in the first two seasons are kind of doing a lot of backdoor deals and kind of wheeling and dealing. Uh, he's trying to get to the presidency and that was really interesting. But then the third season is really kind of him trying to keep it. The third and fourth season is trying to him trying to keep the white house and that stuff is just not as interesting to me like i think he's at his most interesting when he's doing all these backdoor deals and kind of uh stabbing people in the back and that sort of thing so that stuff really uh is super interesting to me the stuff about him like trying to get these laws passed and stuff like that that doesn't really uh interest me all that much this season season five while he's still trying to stay in the white house kind of felt like they were going back to the roots because he is campaigning. This is his, he's campaigning for what will be his first full term because not to spoil anything, he becomes vice president and then he becomes president like halfway into that other president's term. So he still has to campaign for his next full term. So, uh, this is that season. And I just really enjoyed kind of them going back to the roots of him trying to do all these backdoor deals and get people on his side and, and so on and so forth. I just thought it was really, really interesting. It is probably, I would have to rewatch the first two seasons, but I would say it's at least, at the very least, my third favorite season of House of Cards and probably my, even my second 
second, uh, second to only the first season, which is phenomenal. I do really like that Claire, his wife, plays a bigger role as far as the campaign goes because she is now his running mate. Like, I mean, she's always played a big role in the show, in the series as a whole, but I finally feel like they're kind of on the same page, at least for most of this season until the very end where there's a bit of a cliffhanger, which I really appreciated. Um, I'm really excited for season six. I feel like uh, you bring this show up annually every time that it premieres and I say the same thing every year, which is, yeah, this is a show I really want to watch, but I'm just really far behind. And that's kind of where I am still. I'd, I'd really like to get caught up on this show and watch it because obviously it's very um, acclaimed. But I, at this point, am, you said five seasons, so I'm five seasons behind. And, yep. and, and that's a bit of a commitment and I'll eventually get there. But there's so much that I want to watch that uh, it might take a bit. It's definitely something that you have to be in the mood to watch because it's so much of like a character study. There's not a ton of things that actually happen. Like, for for example, I've watched all of the seasons of this show and every once in a while my wife will come in the room and she'll be like, man, every time I see you watch this show, it's just like I must be coming in in the most boring parts of the show because all they're doing is sitting down chit-chatting. And I turn, I'll turn, i turn to her and I'll be like, that's all this show is. Like you're not coming in at the boring parts. You're just watching the show because that's all it is. And uh, so she's like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to like this show. And I was like, nope, nobody asked you to. I didn't. That's why we're not watching it together. But uh, yeah, I really enjoy it because I enjoy that. I enjoy the the dialogue between them and the kind of the cat and mouse type of uh, relationship he has with almost everybody else in the show except for Claire. So I, I really appreciate just the kind of the back and forth, the backdoor deals, like I said. Uh, but it's definitely something that you have to be in the mood for, and it's something that you kind of. I don't want to sound like a douchebag when I say this, but uh, I'm probably going to have to. Uh, you kind of have to – it's a little bit of a thinking man show. Not to say that you, you wouldn't like it. That's not a, at all what I'm saying. I, I definitely think you would. But um, if you're – Yeah, just st- keep backtracking there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like pulled my hammy from backpedaling. <laughs> no, it's just like you have to be in a certain mood to watch it and you have to be a fan of those types of shows to enjoy it. Because if you expect a ton of action in your shows, then you're definitely not going to like it. Yeah, I, I still think that this is a show I could probably get into, but I don't know. I find myself lately just like enjoying putting on a show that I can have on in the background whenever I'm like editing the podcast or, you know, doing research for the podcast or basically anything yeah. involved with the podcast. So uh, it doesn't sound like a, a show that you could do that with, with. So again, it might just be a little bit before I get to it. All right, cool, man. All right, ready for comics? Yeah, so what'd you read this week? So. I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but I, I did have a busy week last week and did not get to read as much as I wanted to. So I do have to talk about a comic that I'm caught up on and that I've talked about pretty tirelessly on the podcast. So I do apologize for that. But luckily, um, it was kind of a monumental issue. So it kind of worked out so that we can talk about it a little bit. But I am going to try to refrain from spoiling it. So the comic I'm talking about is Batman number 24. And by now, chances are that the ending of the comic has been spoiled for you because it was spoiled for me before I even had an opportunity to read it on comicbook.com. It was all over uh, with the final panel of the comic just out there for everybody to see, which is disappointing that they did that. And it's disappointing that it's getting such crazy traction because just for that last panel, because the story that leads up to what happens at the end of the comic is really great. Nobody's talking about that aspect of it. So this issue really dives into Batman's psyche and why he is what he is and why he does what he does. And for me, those are some of the most interesting Batman stories because he's such a complex character and it's always nice to see him humanized um, from time to time and just dive into what makes him tick. So the issue is basically one long conversation between Batman and Gotham girl. They're basically just unwinding after the first 23 issues of the book. Uh, as you'll recall from me and Pat talking about it, 
Uh, most of the first 23 issues, except for the button stuff with the Flash, had to do with Gotham Girl and her brother and um, Psycho Pirate and Bane and all of that stuff and Batman basically trying to save Gotham Girl. So, spoiler alert, she's been saved and this is just them kind of unwinding from all of that. So, there are no villains, there are no fight scenes, it's just a conversation between these two characters. At its heart, it's just a character uh, character study on Batman. He he talks a lot in this conversation with Gotham Girl about how he can never go back to not saving people. He says that he isn't Batman because he likes to be. He's Batman because he's Batman. And that's just how he identifies. And then you eventually, through their conversation, get to the last few pages, which are what everyone is talking about. And again, I won't spoil it. But it's basically a romantic conversation between Batman and Catwoman, which turns into an important conversation between Bruce and Selina. Um, I've always loved the relationship of Batman and Catwoman. Of course, it's been put on display before, um, most notably probably in The Dark Knight Rises, uh, where they, you know, live happily ever after, kind of. But um, I think my favorite iteration of their relationship is definitely in Hush. And this comic definitely leaves things on a bit of a cliffhanger. But all in all, it's a it's a really solid summary of an issue. It's you know summing up those first twenty three issues for for Tom King's first year with Batman, and I would wager um, that it was a very successful one for his run. So I'm excited about what comes next. Yes, I like you have not read a ton. I'm gonna kind of uh, do something very similar uh, to what you had to do for your comic segment just a second ago, but uh, just to kind of talk a little bit about this book i have not gotten completely caught up because i'm still i still haven't read number 23 yet but uh yeah i was super super pissed that comicbook.com spoiled that for and i think they even posted it on like tuesday so there's no fucking way you could have even read it like yeah it didn't come out till wednesday so yeah obviously not yeah so that was that was super disappointing like why would they think that that was okay so I was I pretty guess, pissed about I mean, that. I think it's like clickbait stuff. They just want the clicks. Yeah, but I mean, you gotta. I mean, no, at, I mean, it's at, still shitty. Yeah, I mean, as as far as DC was concerned, like, why wouldn't they do something about it? Because a lot of these like movies and stuff like that, they have re- review embargoes on them, and so you would think that they would have something similar. Like, at least you can't post a review until the thing has come out, especially if you're going to spoil something like that. But I, I don't know. I don't know how all that stuff works, but it was pretty frustrating. I haven't read the comic yet, but unfortunately, I do know what happens because of that spoiler. Yeah, super disappointing. All right. So, like I said, I am not going to talk about anything that's current because, like Tyler, I've been really, really busy. I left Thursday for Vegas, and I have not gotten – I just got back until – I just got back on Sunday. So, I haven't really gotten a chance to read a whole lot. I did, however – uh, download uh, volume two of all new Wolverine on my iPad for the, the plane ride over there. And I was able to read it. Um, I talked about this book first when we reviewed Logan on that episode. And I had always heard good things about this book. Uh, but until I read it, I didn't really believe anybody. But I absolutely loved uh, volume one. I've been kind of collecting the issues since. I think I started at like issue 18 or 19, and I've kind of been collecting them since. I've been dragging my feet on reading volume two because volume two is the all new Wolverine Civil War two tie in, which I've stated before on the podcast. I didn't really like that event uh, too much. I actually gave up on it. I think after issue six or it was five or six or something like that Uh, so i didn't even finish it so i have no idea how it finished uh so i've been kind of dragging my feet about reading uh the volume two of this book because it was tied into that shitty event but luckily she kind of stayed out of the fray for the most part of civil war two like i mean there wasn't a whole lot to tie this volume to Civil War II other than uh, Ulysses, who is the inhuman that basically started uh, this Civil War. He does have a minor role in this, but it mainly focuses on X-23's relationship with her clone and how she's trying to become the mentor that to her clone that Logan really wasn't to her for a long time. Like Later in her life, he does become a big part of her life, but for the most part, he kind of just didn't really bother with her and she's she's trying to be a better mentor to her clone than he was to her that relationship is really 
well done. Like, I, I really appreciate that. Like, in the first volume, it was kind of her relationship to Logan and how that kind of drives her to be a better uh, superhero and a better Wolverine. And then this volume is kind of focusing on the relationship between her and a clone. And I really, I like that a lot. It is pretty serious, but there is some humor in it. Not a ton of humor, uh, but because they kind of sprinkle it in here and there, it does hit pretty well uh, when it is there. Unfortunately, there is some uh, confusing time travel, which of course is my favorite. There's like a new, or the not a new, but uh, a different Logan from a different dimension and a different time that comes popping up here and there in this volume, which is super annoying, but also he's kind of crucial to the story. Like you don't get where they're going without this particular character in the story. So uh, yeah, it's a little bit annoying, um, but for the most part, I really, really enjoyed this volume and it kind of bums me out that I waited so long to read it because it's just really, really good. Yeah, this is a comic I wish I would have hopped on more towards the beginning. I remember after seeing Logan, you and I went to one of the local comic book stores in Evansville and I was trying to find back issues and the employees weren't very helpful and so I just kind of gave up on it and never revisited it. But this is definitely something that I'd like to read in the future. Oh yeah, man. It's, it's really great. I would definitely recommend it. Awesome, dude. You ready for nerd news? Yeah. What do you got this week? All right. So you would think that since it was a bit of a longer period between recordings that there'd be all sorts of stuff, but unfortunately there's just a few things. Uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up was the black Panther teaser. Did you watch this? I did. So how about that, man? I know that you weren't a fan of the poster. I saw what you posted on on our Facebook page, which I agree it was pretty shitty Photoshop. But that trailer, man, it was not what I was expecting. And I mean that in a good way. It looks really vibrant and, and just interesting, like nothing I've ever seen before. I have pretty high hopes for this movie now. I kind of already did with the the cast and, and yeah. who was creatively involved in the movie. I thought that it could be really good, but it doesn't look like it's super connected to Marvel, like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As much as I love the universe, it's kind of cool to finally see something that's a little bit different. And it's kind of, yeah, he is a character in this universe, but – he kind of has his own world to deal with, and I really like that because that's what the comic was that I read. Uh, I actually ended up dropping it, I think, after issue 11. But, I mean, not because it was bad. It was just because I read a lot, and it wasn't quite what I wanted it to be. But, uh, yeah, I, I think this movie has uh, some really cool things going on with it. Yeah, I, I think Ryan Coogler is honestly just going to be like the next – Oh, I mean, he already is a great filmmaker, but I think that he's definitely got a bright future ahead of him. He has made some quality stuff, and this looks like it's going to be that as well. So I'm excited. Oh, yeah, for uh, sure. Th- this next one is a bit of casting news, and I don't know how concrete it is, but it's a rumor out there, and it's kind of a silly rumor at that. So obviously, talk about it at length. I'm a huge Disney guy, and Guy Ritchie is making a live-action Aladdin movie. So live action Aladdin movie means that you need a villain, uh, Jafar, of course, and Tom Hardy uh, is rumored to be playing Jafar in the live action Aladdin movie. And I want to say at one point on this podcast, I brought up that they had said that they weren't going to whitewash this movie and that they were going to cast it with Middle Eastern actors. And Tom Hardy is Caucasian and Irish, I believe. So... I don't think that that works out well on paper. Oh, no, it's it would be a terrible choice. I I bet that it doesn't happen because there's kind of been an outcry about it. Like, yo, guys, you just fucking said that you weren't going to whitewash this movie. And the first casting news we get is that a white guy is playing the villain. So um, I think that they just need to stay true to what they said, you know, hire Middle Eastern actors and go that route, because otherwise it's just. Even if it wasn't about whitewashing, it's he's does not remind me of Jafar at all. So uh, obviously you have to make it your own, but I would see it hard for him to make Jafar his own. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely a talented actor, and I think he would do a good job if he was cast in that role. I just think it would be 
poor choice. Like, and not as acting goes, but just because of the controversy that's been going on for the last couple of years, the fact that they went out and said that they weren't going to do exactly what they would do if they casted him. I, I don't know. It's just weird. And there's so many good Middle Eastern actors out there that you could go out and get somebody and they could do a really uh, good job and you don't need that big name. Cause I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's Aladdin. You already have a big name. The franchise itself yeah. is a big name. So I don't think you necessarily need anybody to carry it because I think it's the name alone kind of is going to bring people to it. So I think you cast who you need to cast as far as the best actor that you can get and not have to worry about the name recognition. For sure, man. 100% agree. Uh, I am going to turn it over to you in one second for anything E3 related you want to talk about. But before I do that, I would be remiss if I did not bring up Adam West and his unfortunate passing over the weekend. He was, I believe, 88, 86 or 88 years old and, of course, was TV's Batman. So he did pass away over the weekend, unfortunately. Yeah, and it's pretty sad stuff. Yeah, I didn't realize he was that old. I mean, not that it makes it less sad of course anybody yeah, passing absolutely. it's sad but uh i wasn't aware that he was that old he just because he was so vibrant and every time you would see him he was just in such high spirits that uh, you can't imagine that that person i believe he was 88 but uh yeah. you just can't imagine that that person's that old yeah i 100 percent agree and i obviously he didn't do a ton of live action work over the last few years, but he did that Batman caped crusaders animated movie last year. And I mean, he, his voice was amazing and he's done family guy forever and he stayed busy and, uh, he'll definitely leave a void in the entertainment world. Oh yeah, for sure. So, uh, all right. E3. So honestly, I mean, obviously if you're not aware, you, probably are because you're listening to this podcast but uh e3 is kind of the big i kind of explain it to people as the video game con like comic-con except for video games so uh it's always a big deal every year this year to be honest with you seemed a little lackluster now granted x or not xbox but microsoft had their presentation yesterday and so they uh talked a lot about the xbox one Scorpio project, which ended up being Xbox One X, which I've been really looking forward to kind of them coming out, especially for a release date and a price because they had come out with some specs a few months ago, I think it was. So I was really looking forward to some more concrete details about Scorpio project, which of course they decided to call it the Xbox One X. It is going to be released on November 7th, and here's the big one. Uh, the price is going to be $4.99. So what do you think about that, Tyler? I So I saw the announcement of the Xbox One X, and I kind of looked at some of the specs. That price tag is ridiculous, right? Yes and no. Like, for – now – I'm not going to pretend like I know a lot about this kind of stuff, but from what I understand, what I've read, I, I, I do subscribe to a various like tech related, uh, YouTube channels. So I, I do watch some of the stuff. I don't know it personally, but from what I understand, it's a very impressive machine. And so they were kind of some of the YouTubers and the bloggers and stuff that I read and watch were kind of nervous when they first heard of the specs. Cause they were like, I don't know how they're going to make this cheap. Like it's going to be around $500. It's kind of what they were saying, but I was still thinking there's no way they'll, they'll price themselves out of the market with 499. But I have heard it's a really powerful machine, but still 499 yeah. is pretty I, ridiculous for a console. If it was, a hundred to a hundred and fifty dollars cheaper, I'd be really tempted to upgrade my Xbox One when it comes out. But at four ninety nine, I don't see I'm like my Xbox One runs fine. Obviously, there's some stuff with the Xbox One X that I'd I'd much rather have. But sure, at this point, I'll have to wait for it to go down in price before I upgrade my Xbox One because, like I said, it's it's working just fine. It gets the job done and. Uh, five hundred dollars for me isn't worth it. Now, if you're if you don't own an Xbox and you're buying one new, like why not get the Xbox One X? That's great. But 
you know, there's a lot of people that own Xbox Ones and, and you want to get them to upgrade to this new model. And I just think that price tag is not going to do it. Yeah, you're basically paying for a powerful machine, which is great. But uh, I mean, there's not any other reason to upgrade. Like for those that have 4K TVs, which I don't have one right now, I will eventually within the next year or two get one. So that will be something that I'll definitely have to think about. But right now, the the big selling point is that it's a po- more powerful machine and it has 4K resolution. That doesn't really do me a whole lot of good because I don't have a 4K TV right now. But, uh, I mean, it does sound pretty cool, but it's just backwards compatible. So they're still going to be coming out with Xbox One games. So my Xbox One is still going to play all the games that are be- going to be coming out. So it's not yeah. like I, it's not like your regular upgrade. Like when they went from the 360 to the one, they were coming out with Xbox One games that you couldn't get for 360. Well, for, from what I understand, for the foreseeable future, it's going to be Xbox One games. You can play them on Xbox One X, and you can also play them on Xbox One. So it doesn't really – it's not really forcing me to upgrade quicker than I normally would have. Yep, exactly. All right, so – there, I mean, there's a lot of different games that were announced and, of course, had trailers and stuff for. Um, the big one for us and for me was uh, Battlefront 2. They released a lot more information. They had already released a trailer for it, which looked really cool. But they also released a little bit more information. I actually posted this on our Facebook page that they're no longer going to be uh, paid DLC on the Battlefront 2 they're just going to have different season passes that are going to be completely free. So I thought that was kind of cool. And I posted this on our Facebook that it kind of felt like an apology for Battlefront because we've talked a lot about this on the on past episodes. That game was a shit show. Like I oh, played sure. that maybe 10 hours and I think that's being generous. Like it just – the multiplayer is cool, but it, it wasn't – first of all, it was super buggy. And it was hard for me to get a game, and it was super chaotic, and I just didn't really like it that much. And then the fact that you don't have a single-player campaign, it felt like I was getting 50% of a game. And so now that they have uh, a really cool idea for a campaign that I think is going to be super successful, and now they're basically giving away DC DLC for, for free, it feels like it's almost an apology for Battlefront, the first game. Oh, I 100% agree. I can't remember the last time I was so disappointed by a game. I was so pumped for that game, and it was just a shit show, and I probably didn't even put uh, five hours into it. I probably, probably honestly less than that. It was very disappointing. So I'm trying to keep my expectations in check with this game, but everything I've seen so far looks great, so I am excited. Yeah, it looks really cool. I mean, there has been a ton of games that was the big one for me or for for us in the podcast. I know they did some Assassin's Creed Origins. Uh, they had a bunch of PlayStation games, which I just recently got a PlayStation 4 literally today for the first time since PlayStation 1. So none of that really made a big deal to me because I haven't played PlayStation forever. I'm looking forward to kind of catching up on some of the exclusives that I haven't been able to play in the last couple of years, but I'm definitely looking forward to that. But the other big one for me personally, you may or may not care. I know you're not a huge Madden fan is Madden 18 has a actual story mode. Now I thought that was pretty clear or pretty cool. So I've been saying this for a little bit now. I've, I talked about uh, NBA 2K17 uh, not too long ago, and I said, I really only play those games for the, my career, and I kind of wish Madden would do something like this. And I'd like to think that they were listening to that because they actually instituted something that sounds a lot like uh, NBA's uh, My Career. It's called Long Shot is the, the mode it's going to be called, and it's basically you're playing this character who went to a big – I think they said Texas is the the university he went to. And then he's kind of been out of football for a couple of years. And this is kind of his last shot to make it into the NFL. So you're basically starting as this amateur and you're trying to build yourself up to get to the the NFL. So uh, I think it could be cool. They kind of say that the inspiration for it is like Friday Night Lights. But let's be honest, it's NBA 
my career. Like that's exactly yeah. what it sounds like, but they obviously can't say that probably for legal reasons, but they kind of said that the inspiration is like TV shows like Friday night lights that kind of, they blend football and kind of personal drama. So I'm looking forward to it. I know that you're not a big fan of that kind of stuff, but I, I really do enjoy that on uh, NBA 2k games. And so I'm really looking forward to it in Madden. Yeah, I was probably not going to get the newest Madden, but this might change my mind. We'll wait and see closer. I do really like that they're trying to get these games fresh since they put them out every year. Yeah, I I mean, it's pretty cool. It was kind of the big gap for me in these games because I do play uh, the NBA game, like I said. And it just seemed kind of silly that they wouldn't have something like that in these games. And they finally do. And I'm really looking forward to hopefully they've waited long enough and they've kind of been able to kind of take out all of the bugs and stuff like that. Cause you always, when, when a game like this puts in something new, they're always, they struggle with it at first. So hopefully they've waited enough time, enough time to kind of work some stuff out. But uh yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I mean, I was going to get this game no matter what. I've actually already pre-ordered it. Even before they, they announced this, I had it pre-ordered. So I was going to get it no matter what. But uh this makes me even more excited for it. Yeah, man. That's awesome. Yeah, so like I said, there's a lot of stuff that has been announced for E3, but I just kind of wanted to keep it on the realm of stuff that we're interested in. Um, if you want to, you can, of course, go to IGN or any of the big nerdy websites and kind of see for yourself what everything that's been announced, but that was kind of the big ones for us. Awesome, man. All right, so our next segment is just kind of plainly titled uh, The Main Topic. It changes from episode to episode, and we are going to review a movie that I was not looking forward to, uh, The Mummy, which is directed by Alex Kurtzman, who is not a director that I really knew of. I had to actually look him up. He actually was the writer and director of People Like Us, which is a Chris Pine drama. I'd seen it a few times on Netflix. I kind of browsed occasionally and saw it. I haven't actually watched it. It looked kind of interesting, but it just kind of looked like a family drama. It looks kind of interesting, like I said, but uh, nothing that I'd actually watched. He's a big producer, though. I mean, he has a ton of producing credits, but not really a ton of writing or directing credits. The Mummy is about an Egyptian princess who was buried alive, who's discovered in modern-day Iraq. Once awoken, she unleashes an evil that the world has never seen. We have talked about this film a lot. Neither of us really expected much from it. That could be clear just by listening to our Rotten Tomatoes film draft. It was our last film that was picked. Honestly, I was kind of hoping that we'd be wrong because I did like The Mummy with Brendan Fraser. Not so much the sequels. I didn't even see the third one. Mummy Returns is all right, but it was kind of overproduced. But I really enjoyed the first one for what it is. It's just kind of a fun uh, popcorn movie. And I really love the idea of a monster movie universe. This is supposed to be the first of the Universal Dark Universe movies. And I really want it to be successful and I wanted it to be good because I think that's a really cool idea. But we'll get into what I actually felt about the movie here in a little bit. So what were you expecting going in, Tyler? I was not expecting much. Uh, obviously, like you said, it was the last overall pick in our Rotten Tomatoes film draft, which unfortunately I ended up with. But the one sliver of hope I had is that Tom Cruise, you know, love him or hate him, he has made some interesting stuff over the last few years, some like the last two Mission Impossible movies were good, and I d- did enjoy Jack Reacher as well. Oblivion was great. So he's picked his projects really well over the last years to kind of rebuild his image. And so I thought maybe this could fall in the vein of some of those movies. But like you said, we'll kind of get into it. Spoiler alert, this that did not this was not like the others so i was overall pretty disappointed yeah so we're just going to jump right into broad strokes which is kind of the first segment we break out break up all of our reviews into uh, segments and this is just kind of the first segment that we're going to do it's kind of a general overview of what we felt about the movie so i expected several things from this movie i kind of expected to laugh at how ridiculous it was kind of smile at some of the cool action i expected to kind of hate the performances because it's a uh, action popcorn movie etc but i didn't expect to be bored and unfortunately i was really really bored 
while I was watching this movie. Like I really had a hard time keeping my eyes open. Now, part of that obviously had to do with the fact that I watched this movie last night and I was a little jet lagged. But at the same time, nothing really grabbed my attention and nothing towards the end really was kept me invested at all in this in this movie or in these characters not really necessarily i don't consider myself a movie snob i can forgive certain things i do like oscar bait type of movies i i do like those types of movies but i can forgive certain films like these popcorn movies if they're entertaining but yeah it really wasn't entertaining and i think a lot of that has to do with uh, promotional material we saw so much for this movie that even some of the more I, I I'll say cooler, but even though I didn't really think they were all that cool, some of the cooler stuff that was in this movie I had seen ten or fifteen times already from the trailers and the TV spots and stuff like that. So I just think that they did themselves a disservice by promoting this movie so much and using so much of the cooler stuff and I, again i'm using cooler in quotations because that's definitely using that as a very loose definition of cool but for example even though they never explained how he got out of the body bag which was disappointing um i'm guessing just <laughs> mummy magic or i don't know how else you would describe it but i think the way that they filmed that scene and the way they kind of used the music that could have been a really kind of cool jump scare moment, but I knew it was coming because I'd seen it 15 other fucking times. So it didn't, yeah. I mean, not that I really get startled at movies too often anyways, but that could have been a really cool moment in the movie and they completely blew their load in the first, I think, teaser trailer. We see that. So it's just, it was super disappointing. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that this movie is more worried about setting up the dark universe than it is telling a compelling or scary story. It's basically one plot device after another to show that this is a universe and there's more monsters out there and it's completely unneeded. As for the mummy part of the movie, that story... Uh, that it actually tries to tell. It's too convoluted for its own sake. It's not interesting. I had no buy-in to the characters or the plot. Uh, the scenes that were meant to be scary or suspenseful, or suspenseful rather, are just really loud and none of the above. So in the end, it's basically a shell of a of a concept that was created to capitalize on basically these universal monsters. And it doesn't feel like there was any real creative input from anybody who cared. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so let's just dive right into the story. You talked a little bit about it in your broad strokes. Honestly, I thought this story was odd. I mean, it was odd for many reasons, but I thought it was odd just the way that they kind of laid it out. Because at first, I kind of felt like they were going to over explain everything because when they kind of go into the mummy's backstory, her backstory, they over explained everything. But then later in the movie, they didn't really explain anything. So it was just kind of a weird dynamic that they set at the beginning of the movie and they didn't really follow through and the rest of the movie, which is fine. I, c I can understand the thought process of like, OK, well, let's not over explain everything. Let's just get to the fun stuff. This is a fun popcorn movie, but then, like you said, this is supposed to be the kickstart of their dark universe, so you would think they would want to uh, try to explain some more stuff. Like, there's just stuff that's in here, and I have no idea why it's in here. Like, you could literally take Russell Crowe's character out of this movie, and it wouldn't be a different movie. I, I don't, I oh, don't even sure. care. Like, I don't care what's happening in the last act because of all the shit that came in the second act that – didn't need to be in there. And the fact that they, like you said, just kind of wanted to kickstart their dark universe and didn't really care too much about like building characters or having a cohesive story. Like they basically just threw some characters in this weird situation and expected it kind of just work itself out from there. And it was really kind of just boring like i said in my broad strokes like i expected a lot out of this movie not necessarily a lot as far as my expectations being high but just kind of like i expected certain things from this movie just from the promotional material and i got almost none of that and i was just basically bored the entire time but uh yeah it was just kind of it was really weird they 
just like I said, just threw all these characters in and kind of hoped for the best. And they just kind of took some things from other movies that was just like a blatant ripoff. Like her sucking these guys' souls or whatever she was doing to make the mummy yeah. zombies. That's just flat out taken from the first mummy movie, which is <laughs> fine if you're like, okay, well, we're kind of – we're rebooting this. So that's the kind of homage – to that original movie i can get that but uh they took something from american werewolf in london jake johnson's character is basically that character yes from, oh my god like that was flat out just just stolen from that movie that's which exactly is, what i told my wife when it was over like just ripped off yeah so that was super super confusing and it wasn't even well done either like it oh, was no. really stupid and they kind of forgot about it uh, like halfway through the movie, which is good because it was a really stupid character. But uh, yeah, this story was just really, really dumb. Yeah. I mean, exactly what you said. I was so bored with it. I don't like you. I, I was really close to falling asleep a couple of times and because I was so uninterested, it was almost hard to throw thoughts together about the movie because it's, I'm just so indifferent to it. Uh, like I said in my broad strokes, it's definitely more, more convoluted than it needs to be. Each plot twist or attempted scare really falls flat. Um, at no point was I ever bought into the characters, or, and I didn't care about anyone in this movie's fate. The best word that I can actually use to describe this story is that it's hollow. There's nothing at its core. It does nothing with char character development. It has an underutilized villain with lame motives, and just nothing that makes you care or invested. It felt like an Indiana Jones ripoff minus everything that makes Indiana Jones awesome. So kingdom of a crystal skull. <laughs> I don't know which, uh, we'll get to star ratings, but what do you, what do you think is better? Kingdom of the crystal skull or this movie? Oh man, that's, it's, it's really hard because I hate that movie I know, so Apple's much, better, right? but, uh, I would say, I would say Indiana Jones is better because I care more about it and it's more fun. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, I, yeah, it sucked. It's not a good movie. Don't watch it. Just stick with the original trilogy. Huh. But if I had to choose between these two movies, I'm watching that movie for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, nothing that the kingdom of the crystal skull did made me care about those characters more, but there was also three movies that made me care about indies. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree. At least I cared about the characters in this movie. And this movie, like I said, just completely indifferent to the story. I really did not care who lived, who died, or what happened at the end. Yeah, for sure. So uh, straight on to the performances. I'm trying to if, – if you feel like I'm rushing through this, it's because I really didn't want to watch this movie and I don't really care that much about it. So we're <laughs> going to get through this as quickly as possible. We do this because we care about you guys. We we don't want you to watch this terrible movie. But uh, performances, uh, it was just really god-awful across the board. Um, I think we can all just agree that, oh, yeah, sure. Tom Cruise has – been in some good movies but have they been good because tom cruise is good i don't no, think he, so he's still one note oh yeah for sure i think he's just a good looking guy that has some charisma but he can't carry a, f a film by himself like this movie was bad and the only way that this was going to be saved and i don't think it could have even been saved is if it had somebody that was a better actor that they could actually carry the material, like rise above it. And he's not one of those guys. He's a good looking guy who has some charisma and he can work well off of other people. But when he's asked to carry poor material, he's not going to do it because he's just not a very good actor. You know what? That's a really good point. Like I was talking in our intro to this review that I really like the last two Mission Impossible movies. And you notice with these Mission Impossible movies, they keep adding stars to the cast and yeah. maybe that's why like they need to buffer tom cruise a little bit yeah for sure he's just i mean he's tom cruise in this movie so he's not bad but he's not gonna blow you away like he's like i said he's not gonna elevate the material i don't think anybody was gonna elevate this material but he definitely is not that guy uh also I can't buy Jake Johnson as an action star. I just can't. I see Nick Miller anytime he's ever on screen and it made it even worse. And I cannot be the only one that noticed this. So I don't know why they didn't just change Tom Cruise's name in the movie, but the fact that he kept calling him Nick every 20 seconds. Now granted <laughs> that was his, Tom Cruise's character's name, but the fact that 
he plays a character named Nick Miller. That's the character he's famous for. And the fact that a, another character in the film is named Nick, it was just, I wanted to like think of Jake Johnson in this movie as a character that he's playing. But every time he said Nick, I was like, oh yeah, he's a new girl and he's really funny in new girl. So I just, I couldn't see him as an action star and they didn't do themselves any favors. But I mean, even the way he like he, at the beginning when he was they they had this gun battle even the way he like carried his weapon looked like he was uncomfortable with it like he wasn't comfortable <laughs> being an action star and i'm not comfortable watching him play an action star cuz it just doesn't fit his uh his wheelhouse yeah i had actually forgot he was in this movie till he showed up on screen and i was like oh thank god maybe there is a character that will bring some levity to this movie and bring me some enjoyment and then of course he's underutilized or i don't know if underutilized is the right word he's not utilized correctly to oh his yeah skills, for sure to his skill set so that was extremely disappointing i was also disappointed that uh sophia botella who plays the mummy who was also in kingsman didn't have much to do or i guess she had stuff to do but i feel like she's an actress that has potential and none of that was tapped in this movie either she was just wasting away in this movie every time you saw her i was just like you're too talented to be in this movie like i get why (laughs) she signed on to this movie because it's the beginning of this huge universe and she has plans of becoming this giant actress but it just i don't know she should have done much better than this movie yeah, at least she still has Atomic Blonde coming out this year with Charlize, Charlize Theron so that it's not a completely wasted year for her. Hopefully that movie's good. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. I, I have high hopes for that movie. But uh, unless you had anything else about the performances, I'm going to move uh, right into the action. Yeah, I mean, do you have anything to say about uh, Sir Russell Crowe? I, I don't know why I said sir. He's not knighted. But he's <laughs> British. He's fucking <laughs> Australian. <laughs> Yo, yeah, well, I mean, do they have knights in Australia? I would doubt it. Okay, well, he's an Australian knight. You, you, I mean, you <laughs> can't look that. I, I don't. I don't know if that's a thing. But uh, he is what he is right now. Like, I don't. He's never gonna be Gladiator Russell Crowe anymore. He looks like that guy got stung by a bunch of bees. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't think he's a very good actor. Hey, for what it's worth, Australia does have knights. Oh yeah, so he could be knighted. He could be Sir yeah. Russell Crowe. Yeah, you never know. Looks like it's a very long list, though, so I'm going to doubt it. Anyways, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really like his super serial voice at the beginning. Like, it felt like he was doing a Batman impression when he was doing yeah. his voiceover. But, uh, yeah, his character was really stupid, and he's not a very good actor. So I was just like, I was really having a hard time staying awake when he was on screen. Oh, for sure. It completely miscast. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is such a big character. And I understand you have to go after a big name for it, but he just does not fit the build for that. Oh, no, not at all. And the character was really shitty, like not well done at all, not no. explained. He looked really shitty. Like when he eventually becomes the monster, the monster was nothing like it was really yeah. like really poorly done. Like, I don't like Leave a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, but when I do like about that movie is they went big with that monster and i think that's what you should do or even uh van helsing i didn't think van helsing did a bad job with it either no that that was pretty cool as well all right so all right you ready for action yeah like i said earlier it was really boring like a lot of the cooler stuff and again i'm using cool in quotes you saw that in the the promotional material like the airplane scene oh, even yeah. though that wasn't even that cool I had already seen it like 10 times. Like really while I was watching it, I was just like, they're just rolling around in a airplane right now. Like that's all it felt like was that they were just kind of rolling around. And I wasn't on the edge of my seat at all during any of these action. It was pretty bland. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that stuck out in this movie to me, uh, kind of like what you said was the airplane scene. I thought that was well shot and I thought it was kind of a cool scene, but again, already ruined for you you see most of it in the trailer so nothing of note uh for me yeah it was a it was definitely disappointing because you kind of expect that 
the, the, the performances aren't going to be very good or you're not going to really like the story or, or maybe the creature design is not your taste. But with these popcorn movies, like these fun action movies, at least you expect the, the action to be fun. I just never really got into anything that was happening with this movie at all. Nope, not at all. All right, so let's uh, put a bow on this and never have to talk about it again. Uh, star rating for The Mummy. I think that I will give it one and a half. Yeah, I think I'm going to go one and a half as well. I was kind of teetering between one and one and a half, but I didn't quite hate it as much as I did The Circle because that movie was just <laughs> god awful. And so just like I kind of saved my five stars for – Movies that are just spectacular. I've only ever given one movie a five star. I've only ever given, I think, one or maybe two movies one star. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to save that for the spectacularly bad. And that wasn't quite this movie, but it wasn't that far off either. I completely agree. All right. So our last segment is just called Nerd Favorite. Tyler and I take turns asking us. Are asking each other uh, a question. It's usually what your favorite blank is. The The topic changes from episode to episode since we just talked about The Mummy, and that is going to be part of the Universal's Dark Universe. I thought that we could talk about our favorite Universal monster, and I'm going to take, I think, what will be the most obvious answer. Uh, my favorite is Frankenstein. Not necessarily because I like the character that much. I'm going to kind of cop out a little bit, but because I love uh, Young Frankenstein so much, that movie is fantastic. Um, it's a Mel Brooks movie. If you haven't already seen it, uh, what are you doing? You definitely uh, so check that out. It's hilarious. But I just I've really loved that character because of that movie. Um, just since I was little, since I, I first watched that movie, I've been kind of drawn to the character. Now, of course, it's been overdone in movies and and TV just to death because. It's a popular monster, and so everybody wants to do one of those, oh, you think you know the story, but you don't really know the story, those types of origin type of movies that get super overplayed and super annoying. But I, I've always just really liked the character, and I'm still looking for a really solid Frankenstein movie since Young Frankenstein. Yeah, you totally copped out there for sure. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean Frankenstein was – I don't know. I was going back and forth between Frankenstein and the character that I'm going to say. So the character I would say would be, um, if you know me from the things I've said on the podcast, probably not too surprising, uh, the Wolfman. Yep. I, I just, I've really always gotten into werewolf stories. I've talked about a few different ones that I've liked on the podcast before. I do have to kind of put my tail between my legs a little bit and say that I've never seen the original Wolfman movie, black and white classic universal monster version i'd like to watch all of those movies but i'm just not well versed in them as of this recording that being said the wolfman movie with benicio del toro that came out a few years ago um, i thought was underrated it's by no means a great movie but i think it's serviceable and it's something that i watch every so often in shocktober so i did like that movie and then of course just other werewolf movies that are amazing. American Werewolf in London, which we talked about in our review of The Mummy, is just a masterpiece. And I've always just liked those stories a lot. So I'll go with that character. Yeah, I think we're going to have to agree to disagree with The Wolfman. I really did not like that movie at all. Yeah, I mean, you and a lot of other people didn't like it. I found some enjoyment in there. It's Like I said, it's by no means great, but I think it's a serviceable werewolf movie because they're typically not good yeah um, they typically fail more than they succeed so for sure all right so that is it for episode 144 of the nerds you're looking for podcast as always we'd appreciate if you subscribe rate review us on itunes sit your radio basically any good podcatcher you use we're on it you can also check out our website the nerdspodcast.com which i will be doing a weekly blog series um, i'm going to be skipping this week just because i'm going to be so crazy busy trying to get caught up from my miniature vacation last weekend but uh i will definitely be back next week i don't exactly know what i'm going to write about just yet but uh it'll be something kind of more loose and, and kind of a little bit more fun 
as always, I'd appreciate if you comment and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which I've been doing a lot of different Let's Plays. I'm finishing up my Injustice 2 Let's Plays right now. I've been playing a lot of Mario Kart as well, and I've just been kind of playing a bunch of different kind of stuff. I like to switch it up a lot on our YouTube channel, so definitely check that out. Check out our Twitch channel, which Tyler does a weekly stream Monday at 9 p.m. Central. I'm assuming... He will not be doing one tonight because he's in Dayton. Yeah. And so, by the time you g- get this episode, you will have already figured that out. Yeah, so it's on hiatus for this week, next week, and the week after just because okay. I'll be out of town training. All right, yeah, I figured as much. I didn't know if you took your Xbox with you, but I figured you didn't. Anyways, I will also be doing a stream Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Central. I'm currently uh, going through Stick of Truth, the South Park game, because as big of a South Park fan as I am, for whatever reason, I just never played that game. And this is kind of my excuse. The Twitch stream is kind of my excuse to kind of go back and play some of the games that uh, I kind of just let fall through the cracks. And that's one that I started last week that I man I love that game already it's really really fun it's like you're in in an episode of South Park which I love that show a lot so I'm looking forward to uh, streaming that again actually by the time you hear this I'll probably already be streaming because I think this episode is probably going to end up going up on Wednesday if my uh, schedule plays out the way that I think it will this week so uh, definitely be checking out for that I'll be streaming uh, Stick of Truth for the next couple of weeks as always we really appreciate if you follow us on Twitter and Instagram they're both at the Nerds Podcast you also can uh, like us on Facebook follow us on Google Plus email us at the Nerds Podcast oh nope that's not our email email us at the Nerds you're looking for at gmail.com <laughs> we're actually talking about doing another listener question a segment that we did uh, a while back it was probably about six or seven months now ago but uh we're definitely looking to do that so uh start emailing us those questions now and we will get to them when we do another one of those episodes that was a lot of fun so we're looking forward to getting some good good questions again this time and of course vote for us for podcast that month at podcastland.com i am patrick coon as always i'm tyler hunt as Uh, always as well i guess (laughs) and we are the nerds you're looking for take it easy guys bye guys I am Patrick Kuhn, as always. Why did the fuck did you turn it? I don't know. Just go with it. Just go with it. (laughs) I'm Tyler Hunt, as always, as well, I guess. (laughs) And we are the nerds you're looking for. Take it easy, guys. Bye, guys. Yeah, I don't know why I changed it up. I was like, you got to give me a heads up when you change (laughs) shit like that. (laughs) Yeah, that was an accident. I was just like, maybe he'll just go with it. (laughs) But you made it weird, like always. Yep. Sorry about that.